How's it going YouTube? Cody Bernardi here with another YouTube video and in today's video we're going to be taking a look at this exchange vulnerability that was dropped a couple weeks ago. I'm a little late on this but I kind of wanted to take this opportunity to explain not so much the vulnerability itself because you can read about that everywhere online uh, but kind of the processes you can take being on a SOC if you're still trying to triage this vulnerability, how to handle it, what to do in the future, and then I'll also discuss, give you a little insight on what being on a security operations center team is like. I'll, I'll, I'll call it SOC. So SOC, S-O-C, means security operations center. Uh, what that looks like in a Fortune 100 company, kind of what the process looks like, the workflow from the, I guess, the exposure to the vulnerability or notification of the vulnerability all the way up to the compliance side of things and watching the patching. So uh, I want to get the most important stuff up first. So if you are on a security team or you're in charge of mitigating this vulnerability and possibly future vulnerabilities, here are just some tips that you should take in uh, when trying to mitigate this issue. So the most hard hit uh, organizations with this vulnerability and vulnerabilities like this are going to be these smaller businesses that don't necessarily have a full-time security staff that can dedicate all of their time to mitigating things like this while putting out fires and incident response and keeping up with all these different policy mandates and such like that. So the thing that I would recommend you do if you don't necessarily have a lot of tools in place is I, I just actually checked uh, nmap NSE, so that's the network mapper um, NSE scripts. So it doesn't look like they have one yet. Might be able to build one myself, but um, basically what you wanna do is identify impacted hosts inside of your um, ecosystem. That includes internal and external IPs. Internal is pretty easy. Um, obviously you have the RFC 1918 ranges, so 10.0 slash eight. 19, 192.168, 172.16 and all that. So if you want to, you can go ahead and scan those entire subnets. And this is assuming if you have no asset management in place already. So I would go ahead and scan all of those ranges. Um, I know that there is a Metasploit module for this. So I don't know how that scales as far as setting a remote host to a range. I don't know if you can do that. You might be able to work around with a bash script to just automate that exact one-liner in Metasploit. But then again, I don't know. I haven't used it myself, but that's what I would do if I don't have the resources in place. So the first thing I would do is scan the entire network. Um, if you don't have a scanning solution already, um, uh, Nmap does not have an NSE script yet, so that's what I would use. So if you have Qualys or Tenable Procure, those are kind of the main scanning solutions out there right now. Qualys has a QAD of 50108, which is an unauthenticated check, um, which is requires no credentials. There is no agent installed on the machine. This is a complete unauthenticated check. Um, that's why I thought there might've been an Nmap NSE script yet, but I guess not. Uh, so again, that plugin ID is 50108. And the way you would look that up is in the VMDR and you go to vulnerabilities and then assets. And then all you would type in is vulnerabilities.vulnerability.qid colon 50108. Um, I'll put a screenshot of what that looks like and I'll uh, paste down the search query down below. So that's the VMDR query. Um, and that will check for any hosts inside your network. And then for Tenable, the plugin ID is 147171. And uh, I'll also put that search query down below, um, how to search that in Tenable. They have a, uh, a whole video on it. So I'll put both of these uh, articles down below and that's how you check your entire network, assuming you're scanning everything. Um, so that is just kind of a, a basic way to check what's on the network. I can't really explain how you would go about actually patching the systems, identifying owners and all that. But I would say in the future, if you do have either one of these products procured, tag these assets. So do an asset tag in uh, asset view, uh, create a tag and name it exchange or whatever, make a dynamic tag, um, do whatever you need to do, but make sure that you do have critical systems like exchange tagged in your network. Okay, so now there's that. Um, obviously you're gonna have the internet facing the systems, which I believe there are 90,000, which I could probably do a very basic Shodan search on. So I'm looking at Qualys, or not Qualys, uh, 
uh, showed in right now, there are currently 86,895 exposed internet devices online. So I'll actually put a snippet in right now of what that Metasploit module check will actually do and just show you, walk you through all of that. So I'll cut the video out right here. So I actually take it back. There is no Metasploit module as of yet uh, to check for this vulnerability. So I was actually looking a little bit more into this attack and there is an attack chain associated with this. So I didn't even mention it in the video that I was filming up there. So. I'll go ahead and pull it up real quick. So there are some steps needed uh, initially to pull off this attack. So I'll go ahead and pull it up real quick. So Qualys has the whole attack chain right here. So there's a lot that goes into this other than just mass scanning the internet. This is going to be a targeted operation, meaning that there is, you, you can't spray and pray the internet. You need a couple things. Uh, in order for this vulnerability to work. So you need to gather um, email addresses and IPs. So anyways, just wanna show you that. I'll put the exploit code down below. Uh, if you wanna check your own systems, feel free to do it. Okay, so now that we got that out of the way, kinda of showed you how what you could do right now to hopefully put out this fire, um, this dumpster fire to say the least. Now let's talk about the processes and workflows that you would find in a Fortune 100 SOC. Uh, because a lot of these processes handling these critical vulnerabilities is pretty streamlined um, and there's really, I mean, uh, why did that do that? My light, my ring light changed from warm to like cool for some reason. Maybe I could do without the ring light for now. <laughs> I have no idea why I did that, but um. Where was I at? Okay, so the the workflow kind of inside of a uh, Fortune 100 SOC. So there's a couple ways that this vulnerability would have gotten on our radar in a Fortune 100 SOC. Typically with most of these critical vulnerabilities, it's gonna be through detection or notification. So detection would be Qualys or Tenable updates to their knowledge base or their plugin database of this new vulnerability it checks the you know registry on a machine and it just scans and says hey here's a new critical and then we work from there we cut tickets and all that stuff notification would be a something such as like a bug bounty program someone notifies us they talk about the impact and all that stuff um and yeah we work from there and there's also like a caveat to that this really only applies to fortune 500s um is through an embargoed vulnerability program so something that is widespread so like a chipset vulnerability will be embargoed typically so that means that the vulnerability was discovered and reported to the security vendor or the the uh, the actual product vendor itself and they will have all these big companies sign an nda basically saying you can patch but do not talk about this keep this as an as needed or need to know basis and basically we will engage teams to patch they all sign an nda they patch and then it will get publicly released uh, maybe a month or two after, just so that there is not a catastrophe when it comes to mass exploitation of this vulnerability uh, on the large cloud providers or any provider that has critical information on it. So just FYI, um, this isn't like non-public info. You can go on the website, ICASI, that's one of them. And we'll just list off all the companies that are a part of it. So outside of that, then it goes to the actual triaging phase and triaging is typically done with a couple things in mind. So CVSS score is kind of the base metric we go off of. Um, if it's a CVSS 9.0 and above, that's when it gets on our radar where we actually review it. Uh, we check how many impacted assets there are. We don't really care if there's a CVSS 10 and one non-critical device that has not checked into the scanning platform in three years. That doesn't really matter to us. Um, and then there's also the threat model kind of landscape as well, because it's, it's not only CVSS 9.0s and above that we care about. Uh, obviously we do care about those, but things like CVSS 7.0s uh, would be something that we would care about as well because of the threat model. So depending on the business, you might have nation state actors actually looking to actively exploit a little bit more sophisticated vulnerabilities. So those also matter as well, especially if they're internet facing. Then it goes into, are these assets internet facing or are they RFC 1918 assets? 
Um, I keep saying that that is the comment RFC for internal IP addresses. Um, and then let's say, okay, this is an issue and we need to create a security campaign for this. And basically what that means is we will enumerate all of the teams that are impacted. We will find their owner information, like who owns it and their ticket information. So what we would typically do from there is launch a ticketing campaign to all of the impacted asset owners. Uh, and there's different severities of these tickets. Um, they will typically have a paging aspect to it. If it's really bad, uh, it will actually page the service owner and they will remediate and we will track that over time using something like Tableau, Gabbana or Power BI. Uh, and we will hope to see that curve go down. So there's a lot that goes on with this. There is a lot of automation. The only manual part that I can really think of in this is the actual triaging portion where you get in intelligence for the threat and tell team. They're like, yeah, there is some uh, exploit chatter online. Uh, then we get the firewall team. They're like, yep, we've picked up these user agents. So there's you know these different IP addresses trying to actively exploit this particular vulnerability, all this stuff goes into play and it's kind of like a email thread or like a 30 minute meeting. It's like, yes, no, is this bad? Does this require a campaign? Yes, if it does require a campaign. Uh, what we try to do is limit the amount of people we actually interact with because like, one part of security at this scale is calculating how much time is spent actually mitigating a vulnerability. So we try to work with service teams. So like one team will own Windows patching in the entire organization or Linux patching on the entire organization. Um, so we only engage typically one team and then they will then push out like an SCCM patch to all of the systems, thus eliminating the need to reach out to each individual service owner. That adds up to a lot of time wasted uh, doing patching. So that is it. I just wanted to give you all an insight uh, on kind of what you could do with this particular vulnerability. Make sure you enumerate, find the impacted assets, owner information, mitigate. Uh, there are mitigating controls as well, but just make sure you don't end up as this 86,895 figure uh, uh, shown as vulnerable on Shodan. Uh, and then also, um, kind of what the workflow looks like in a Fortune 100 company as far as mitigating this vulnerability. It's pretty streamlined. It honestly takes on the VM team itself maybe one hour uh, from the initial detection to then, obviously it's a little bit more than one hour, but including that 30 minute meeting, whether or not there is a security campaign needed, that gets kicked off. And then the remediation and tracking prop, you know, op tracking portion of it obviously takes a few days over time, just checking in on that and all that. So yeah, anyways, that is it for this video. If y'all enjoy content like this, please hit the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button with the bell notification enabled. I know this is not OSINT related, but this is my day job. This is what I would consider myself, not an expert, but well versed in. Um, I'm hoping to reach out or get in touch with someone at Qualys, Tenable, Splunk, all of these big companies, because these are the companies you're gonna be dealing with uh, when you get a full-time job in security. You're not gonna be using Kali as much as you think you would. You're gonna be using QRadar, maybe Recorded Future, who knows, Rapid7. Just a few to name off the top of my head. So anyways, that's it for this video. Y'all take care, goodbye. <laughs>